All right, so here we are. Uh, man up, session number seven. Tonight we will be drawing upon everything that we've seen up until this point and tying it all together. And we're going to try to tie everything together with one main word, glory. So we're going to try to take everything we've seen in all seven sessions, including tonight, and tie it up in one word, glory. We're going to try to show, I'm going to try to show, how powerful then a man's covering over those in his life under his leadership and care is. So glory in general, and then towards the end, covering. How powerful is it, our covering over those who are in our care, speci specifically our wives and children, specifically our daughters. So what have we seen? What have we seen up to this point? Session one, we saw that from the beginning as part of God's plan, his creation plan, God created man and woman, created us to bear his image and take dominion over his creation. For us to live as God intended, male and female, he created us. This is a foundational truth. This is not a secondary issue. And this is very good. And because it is very good, the devil hates it. And so we who are biblical men should love this truth. Session two, we saw a general call upon us men that biblical men provide and protect, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Session three, we saw that in marriage, in marriage specifically, biblical men are headship husbands who lead and love. We saw marriage is not only greatly encouraged for all men, marriage is assumed in many ways. And so for some of you, this may be a call to find a wife. So you can be a headship husband who leads and loves. Session four, we saw the clear biblical truth that biblical men, not women, biblical men lead God's church as examples of manhood to the church and to the world. Session five, we saw that all biblical men, all true men, have a zealous desire for the word of God, which goes hand in hand with the right worship of God. Those two things are connected. Then last time in session six, we saw that biblical men are patriarchal fathers who bring up children in the Lord, through discipline and instruction. Tonight, we're going to pull it all together with looking at how biblical men are the glory of God and a covering for women. Biblical men are, are the glory of God and a covering for women. You remember at this point the Dominion Commission. First God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over the, all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so in order for humanity to have dominion, what does God do next? The very next thing God does. So God created man in his own image, an image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. And then next, after creating male and female, God blessed them. God blessed them. And how? God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so both man and woman created in the image of God. But then for us to have dominion created different. Man and woman, male and female. This is made clear in the rest of Genesis 1 and 2. It flows throughout the rest of the Bible. But the devil does not want man to have dominion. The devil wants dominion. Which is why, still now, at this very moment, and until Christ returns, we must, Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God, that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And so we saw that right before telling us that in Ephesians 6, right before telling us in Ephesians 6 that we're in a spiritual battle, before telling us to put on the whole armor of God, Paul in Ephesians 5 tells us what are commonly called the household codes. So, wives submit to the headship of their husbands in everything as to the Lord, as the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the church. Husbands, since you are the head of your wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And we'll come back to this tonight. Since you are the head of your wife, as Christ is head of the church, she is to submit to you in everything, meaning you are to lead her in everything. 
to do this rightly, you must love her as Jesus loves the church, even gave his life for the church. As I said before, and in that message, your love does not cancel your headship. Your love does not cancel your headship. But your headship is not biblical headship. If it is not driven by, guided by, your love for your wife. So nourish her, cherish her, sanctify her, wash her in the word, lead her as her head. And you are in a battle against demons for dominion. And this is God's battle plan. Which is why the devil, in Genesis, Satan goes after woman to break up this plan of God. But man, we know, as I preached even yesterday at Revival Church, we who are men of God stand on one side, the side of victory. God has promised the devil will not win. Satan's head will be crushed. His wound is fatal. God, to Satan after the fall, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. If you sit here tonight, saved, follower of Jesus, truly a Christian, that means you know, you know who this skull crusher is, and his name is Jesus. Man, if you've truly repented of your sin, if you've stopped living for self, living like the world, if you've put your faith in Jesus as your Savior, if that is you, then Jesus is your Lord. Is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your master? Anyone who wants to be saved can only be saved by Jesus. And to be saved by Jesus is to follow Jesus, to trust Jesus, to put your faith in Jesus. Faith in him as Lord. Jesus right now is King of kings and Lord of lords. To say you follow Jesus is no small thing. It is not asking Jesus into your heart and getting a go-to-heaven free card. To be a follower of Jesus is to die to self, to pick up your cross, to carry it. To be a follower of Jesus is to stop living for the world, stop living like the world, to be set apart from the world. Therefore, to follow Jesus is to be unlike the world, to be different than the world, to be even different than the worldly church. And quite assuredly, at times, to be disliked by the world. And right now, to follow Jesus in this specific area, biblical manhood, in our world, for you to resolve tonight to live your life as a truly biblical man, is to be set apart. And since Jesus is Lord, and Jesus will crush the devil, we should walk, abide in Jesus. In power, Holy Spirit power. Biblical men are not to be soft, not to be effeminate, not to be just a little bit different from the world. Biblical men are biblical, and we are men. You are not only to live for God, you are not only to live for the glory of God. Man, what I want you to see tonight is biblical men are the glory of God. Biblical men are the glory of God. Did you know that? Has anyone ever told you that? You are the glory of God. I'm about to show you truths that are rarely taught in a church in our day, and the reason they're rarely taught in, our, in the church in our day, I think, is twofold, and I think those two things are connected. These truths are rarely taught in the church today because they're in the midst of a text that is almost never taught in the church in our day. The verses on head coverings. These truths are rarely taught in the church today because the devil wants the curse to reign. For women to want to rule over men, and men, men to not live like biblical men. Not to even know these truths. But biblical men do not ignore texts. We are men of the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. One text I did not mention in the sermon on men leading the church is this text I'm about to show you. This may be my preaching life verse, if there is such a thing. Acts 20, 26 through 28. Therefore, therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock 
in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Paul is saying a lot here. But for now, the reason he says he knows if people, the people in front of him even, if they go to hell, it is not on him. He says that clearly and confidently. He can be sure he is innocent of their blood. Why? Because he was not a coward about teaching the entire word of God. Because he did not shrink back from teaching all of it, the whole counsel of God. And like the verse we talked about in 1 Corinthians 6, the effeminate verse, this is another verse on manhood that many shrink back from teaching on. The one we'll see tonight. And so to improperly, to properly complete a series about biblical manhood, I need to teach from 1 Corinthians 11. As I already said, a few of you have asked questions about this. If you have questions afterwards, I can continue to answer those. This is not specifically a teaching on head coverings. But I also will not do what many do with this text. I will not ignore it. And I will not proof text these verses and speak about the beautiful, powerful, grounding, foundational truths in this text while ignoring the proverbial elephant in the room, the practical reason for the text. With that, let me show you. Truth number one, biblical men are the glory of God. Biblical men are the glory of God. As we enter into this text, the text that is commonly called the head coverings text, I want to look at it from a different angle, and mostly because of the main thing I want you to see in this text is what I have on the screen. Biblical men are the glory of God. So instead of going through it verse by verse, starting at verse 3, I want to look at it from the ground up instead of the top down, pun intended, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. You can open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11. I'll spend quite a bit of time here in 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, verse 7. For man, for a man, for a man, ought not cover his head. Why? Why? And the why is massive. It is not cultural, it is foundational. Since he, man, since he is, men, you are, since he is, the image and, and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. We're going to focus on the second half, the second uh, two-thirds of this verse before we look at the rest. Do you see in this verse the reason the word of God gives for men to not cover their heads while gathered in worship, especially during prayer and prophecy? Do you see it? What is the reason? The reason has nothing to do with Roman custom or something happening in Corinth or women shaving their heads or hair or prostitution or marriage or any other reason you may have heard and yet is nowhere to be found in the Bible. The reason men are to not cover their heads, and by the way, I know, I know most of you all already believe in head coverings when it comes to men. Most men actually believe in head coverings when it comes to men. It's the women part that gets the pushback. I know you all believe in head coverings when it comes to men because every time we have prayed together, any of you all with hats on have removed your hats. Why? Why is this a practice that has persisted for 2,000 years? Why are men not to cover their heads in worship, especially when praying or prophesying? Because you men are the image of God, You are the image of God, and, notice the and, image, and, and what? Men are the glory of God. Whoa. I wonder if when I had it on the screen, before you saw it in the verse, you were wondering, what is he talking about? Men are the glory of God. 
men of the glory of God. That should humble you. This truth alone, this middle third of this one verse in the Bible, should humble you. It should stop you in your tracks. Like Moses removing his shoes in the presence of God's glory, here we are told, let me read it in the word one more time, for man, for a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Glory is a serious issue to God. This is another truth in this series that I cannot overstate. Glory is a big deal to God. Of course, the devil does not want us to know this. Does not want us to believe this or live like this or practice this. The devil, demons, want glory. The devil wanted God's glory and so rebelled against the Most High God. The other angels, good and evil, saw this rebellion happen. The devil even has earthly, worldly power and glory right now. But men, hear me, hear me. Biblical men are the glory of God. Both men and women were created in the image of God. We've seen that from the beginning. Both men and women created in the image of God, both worthy to be image bearers, to show the world who God is, what he is like, to display the attributes of God as a mirror. Men and women created in the image of God. But here we are told, clearly, clearly men, man is the glory of God. And woman is the glory of man. I could not preach a conference on biblical manhood and not tell you men that biblical men are the glory of God. What does it mean that man is the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man? What does it mean that man is the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man? Let's start with the word glory. In the Greek, doxa. Like doxology is to sing of God's glory. The word glory or doxa, the word means a visible honor. Visible greatness. Greatness you can see. Honor you can see. Splendor. Great prestige or reputation. So let's start with the more obvious one. Man is the glory of God. Biblical men, this is huge for you. This is huge. This is huge for God's church. This is huge in this world. I believe this truth needs to be seen and lived, that men are the biblical men are the glory of God if a true revival is to happen in our world in its current state. What if you lived out this one truth, this one truth in all the areas of your life? That you are the glory of God. What would it mean for your relationship with the Lord? What would it mean for your marriage, your relationships in general, your fatherhood, your work? What would it mean for you when tempted to sin? What would it mean for your priorities? If you believed, you are the glory of God. What if churches still taught this and practiced this truth week by week? Maybe the cultural church wouldn't be so weak. Maybe the cultural church would be less about making us feel good about ourselves as sinners or our emotions and more about how we are to live in God's power in the fear of the Lord as the glory of God. You must know this to properly live as the glory of God, to live for the glory of God. In order to live properly for the glory of God, we must know and believe we are the glory of God. Oh man, if our number one purpose in life will be to live for, to display, to proclaim, to give our lives even to the glory of God. And as his glory, to live for his glory. If someone were to ask you tomorrow morning, for whose reputation do you live for? For whose prestige do you live for? For whose greatness and visible honor do you live for? 
Biblical men must be able to honestly answer that question. I live for God's honor, God's greatness, his reputation, his glory, because I am the glory of God. Biblical men must live primarily for the glory of God, to live in a way that shows God's greatness, to live in a way that gives him all honor, to live in a way that gives him glory that is visible, noticeable, obvious. Glory is obvious. You must be a visible display of the glory of God because you men, biblical men, are the glory of God. So what does it then mean that woman is the glory of man? Remember, woman also created in the image of God, obvious in Genesis 1, obvious in this text even, woman created in the image of God to display his attributes. But woman is the glory of man meaning she is to live primarily for the glory of man, to live in a way that shows man's excellence, to live in a way that gives him honor, that is noticeable and obvious. Woman, according to this text, even to live for the glory of God, is living for the glory of God by living for the glory of man. We've seen this throughout. This is a deep truth, a glorious, garden-originating truth. This is about as opposite of what the world thinks and teaches as you can get, and yet it should be obvious to us by now. Man, you are not to live for your own glory. The devil does that. The devil wants you to do that. You must, to truly be a man of God, live in a way that shows God's greatness. To live in a way that gives God all the honor. To live in a way that gives God all the glory because you are God's glory. Let me say it this way. We men are God's image when we live to show the attributes of God. We men are God's glory when we live to show the excellence of God. We are God's image bearers when we show as a mirror, a reflection, who God is. What are his attributes? What is God like? We are God's glory when we live to show his excellence, his beauty, his perfection, his glory. So for woman, woman is the image of God, so she is to live to show the attributes of God. And here we are told in this text, woman is the glory of man, and therefore to live to show the excellence of man, who is the glory of God. The reasons given for this We're given reasons for this truth in the text right after this verse, verse 7. And those reasons, the reasons we're about to see, should also be obvious to us by now. What the Word of God says next is what you should already know the Word of God is about to say. Why is man the glory of God and woman the glory of man? Verses 8 and 9. For man was not made from woman, but woman for man, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Woman created from man, for man, pulling back to Genesis here. And therefore, because of those truths, we see the word for at the beginning of this text. Therefore, therefore, man is the glory of God and woman is the glory of man. We know it was not good for man to be alone, so the Lord God said, I will make him a helper fit for him, a helper fit for man, to live for man, created from man, therefore woman is the glory of man. And again, yes, created in God's image, but when it comes to glory, woman is the glory of man, and biblical men are the glory of God. So man is to lead, to provide, to protect, to teach. A woman created to help man. Help by being led by man. As the glory of man. And therefore woman is also, also to be under the headship of man. Glory and headship are not cultural. They are not time constrained. This is creational and God ordained. 
And we are not properly living to the glory of God as man and woman, for that matter, unless we live for God's glory. Unless we live for God's glory. And so this glory, in this text, is also used as a ground, a reason for headship. We jump up to verse 3. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. The word the ESV translates wife here is the Greek word that translates more broadly as woman. So this is a principle. This principle, of course, applies to marriage, but more broadly, this principle. Same verse in the LSB, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. The man is head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. We would never question if the man Jesus lived under the headship of God the Father. We would never question if the man Jesus lived under the headship of God the Father, and we would never question if the man Jesus lived for the glory of God the Father. And so it is this principle, this truth, that the word of God is applying now to manhood and womanhood. Biblical man lives for and obeys Jesus Christ as his head. Biblical man lives to and as the glory of God, to glorify God. And woman, woman lives under the headship of man, as the glory of man. And so we go back to where we started. For man ought not cover his head. Why? Since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Biblical men are the glory of God. The word of God here is saying, God is saying to us, biblical men, this is the reason. This is a dominion commission, devil hating, God glorifying reason. Biblical man is the glory of God, and woman is the glory of man. And Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. Therefore, universally now, universally we see in this same text, the word of God is saying man should not cover his head. Man should not cover his head while worshiping God, especially while praying and prophesying. This should be clear to us at this point. Why? Why have Christian men from the time of the apostles until about 1950, from the time of this was written until about 1950, and still for the most part today when it comes to men, why have biblical men, including you men, for the most part, not worn a hat to church, especially, especially while praying or prophesying? As a side note, this Christian practice was adopted by Americans during the singing of the Star-Spangled Banner. Do you know why? First, because of the influence of biblical Christians upon society. Second, because of glory. What do we call the flag? Old glory. So we remove our hats and we turn towards the flag. Let me ask you a question, men. Who, it's a pretty obvious question, who should get all the glory when we gather to worship God? Oh, wait, because it's that obvious. God, okay. Who should get all the glory when we gather to worship God? God should. God should. Seriously, should men get the glory when we're worshiping God? No. We are not to get our own glory while we are worshiping God. Should women get glory? Well, no. They are not to get glory while we are worshiping God. And so the word of God here in 1 Corinthians eleven seven 7 says, Men, you are the glory of God. So do not cover God's glory. You are the glory of God, so do not cover God's glory while worshiping God. That would be to dishonor God and misrepresent the truth if you were to cover the glory of God while worshiping God. And why the head? Because you are the head of woman. So to cover your head is to say you are not the head, but woman is, and that would be effeminate. A man who covers while worshiping God, especially while praying and prophesying, is covering God's glory and saying, in effect, I am not the head. And so briefly then, to 
close the loop according to this teaching. Why then are women, women to cover their heads in worship, especially when praying and prophesying? This, by the way, was the universal practice of the Christian church in the world until about, or for about 1,900 years. The universal church and the Christian, the universal practice of the Christian church in the entire world for about 1,900 years until the radical feminist movement started a movement, specifically movement against head covering in the mid 1900s. It was in newspapers. It spread. It should bother us to, to our core that this is how it stopped. If you're wondering about that history, even Wikipedia agrees with what the history I just gave. So given these truths, why then are women to cover their heads in worship, especially when praying and prophesying? Well, women are the glory of man. Women are the glory of man. So while worshiping God, God should get all the glory. Man should not get any glory. So man's glory should be covered. So we cover the glory of man as we worship God. And also, a woman has glory of her own. What is woman's glory? Verses 14 and 15. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman long, has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Notice it does not say her hair is the covering. The Greek word for covering here in this verse is different than the word for head covering in the rest of the text. But what do we see here for sure? A woman's hair is her glory. A woman's her hair is her glory. And since only God is to get glory while worshiping God, especially while praying and prophesying, to not cover her glory is to not cover man's glory and to not cover her own glory. And woman is also under the headship of man. She is not the head, so she should cover her head in worship, especially while praying and prophesying. We see this in verse 5. But every wife, woman, who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head, referring to her husband, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. And so we get this in verse 10. This is why a wife or woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. So we have headship, we have glory, we have authority, and now we have angels. Yes, angels are watching and asking, will man, will woman obey God when it comes to glory and authority? Will they worship God and give him all the glory, or will they want some glory for themselves? And why is this such a big deal to angels? Because the devil is a fallen angel, and he rebelled against God. Why? Because he wanted his own glory. He did not want to be under God's headship. And so in addition to all we have seen, we now see the devil and angels... Wondering if we believe how glorious and good God's ways are and how glorious and good our God is. When we obey God, and the word applies that specifically here to this practice of head covering, for the glory of God. For completeness sake, he ends the text this way. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. If you look at what the Bible does next, the very next verse, it goes on to another practice of all churches of God. Paul teaches next on communion. Let me summarize for our purposes tonight. Biblical men are the glory of God. A truly Christ-following, spirit-filled biblical man shows God glory, God's glory as does nothing else in creation. Let me say that again. A truly Christ-following, spirit-filled, biblical man shows God's glory as nothing else does in creation. This is especially true and to be honored as we worship God, including by not covering God's glory. In worship, God alone must be glorified. And you men are the glory of God. You are to live for the glory of God. You are to live as the glory of God. This means biblical men are not some second-class citizens to cultural educated elites. 
Biblical men are not second-class citizens to feminist women. Biblical men are not second-class citizens to Hollywood elites or politicians. Biblical men are not second-class citizens to hotshot YouTube so-called pastors. Biblical men who live for God's glory and live as God's glory are the men who are to show this world who God is. How worthy he is. How awesome he is. To show this world what truth is. We are to show this world what manhood is. We are to show this world how men treat women. We are to show this world how to work, how to provide, how to protect, what a true husband is, what a true father is, what a true leader is. Biblical men are the only men who can truly know what truth is. And therefore, we are to crush any lofty argument against truth. Because biblical men live for the glory of God by living by every word of the word of God because biblical men have been saved by the Son of God. Men, over these seven sessions, you've seen in the word of God what biblical manhood is, and now you know that when you live your, live your life as a biblical man, when you are living your life for the glory of God, you are to live that way because you are the glory of God. And men, you can only truly do this if you are born again in Jesus Christ. If you've repented of your sin because you've heard the good news of Jesus Christ. The one who came to save God's people from our sins. The one who came to be our Lord and God. The one who showed and proved and displayed that he is truly, truly glory. I've said this in every message of this series, but I'm going to say it again. God created us. God is holy. God is perfect. And we have all fallen short. We have all sinned. And yet God sent his son to live the life we have not lived, to die the death we deserve, and to rise again, to crush the works of the devil, and to bring us new life. If you have not truly repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus as your Savior, do it now, do it tonight. Those of us who have Jesus as a Savior must have Jesus as our Lord because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the only one who can save anyone from hell. Repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus. And then, by his Spirit in you, live by faith. Men who live by faith in Jesus are living for the glory of God because biblical men are the glory of God. Just a few chapters after speaking on headship and glory and in the head covering section, Paul says in this same book, gives men this call. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. And now you men, we men, have seen how biblical men are to act like men. Biblical men are to live as men. Biblical men provide and protect. Biblical men are headship husbands who lead in love. Biblical men lead God's church as examples of manhood to the church and the world. Biblical men are zealously devoted to the word of God. Biblical men are patriarchal fathers who bring up children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And biblical men are the glory of God. I want to end by showing you an example of how big a deal this is. We're going to go back to the garden. And then I want to truly end by encouraging you to live this way, boldly, radically, counterculturally, at any cost for the rest of your life. So that you, so that we leave a godly legacy for the glory of God. Back to where we started. Back to the garden. <clears throat> Imagine the scene. Man and woman, naked and unashamed. The devil arrives. Satan shows up. Man is not deceived. Woman is deceived by the devil. At any point then, men could have, man could have led, he could have taught, corrected, provided, protected, yet he stood by, he did nothing. And then he listened to the voice of woman and took and ate. 
And although it is risky to do for a moment, I want to ask, what if? What if? I'm sure we've, you've thought it throughout this series. What should have he done? What could have he done? What could have man done as he hears what is happening? As he sees woman being deceived? Even as he sees she has now vowed in her mind to eat the apple. Maybe even after she took and ate. What could he have done? And now God comes to them. And remember, he goes not to woman, but to man. Well, he could have said, no, I'm not eating that. I'm not going to disobey God. And woman, you also should not disobey God. Or you should not have disobeyed God. Was there anything else he could have done? Let me show you this. Biblical men are the glory of God and a covering for women. Biblical men are the glory of God and a covering for women. <clears throat> Number 30, verses 6 through 8. This is speaking of an unmarried daughter who has now become married. And it says, if she, an unmarried daughter, if she marries a husband while under her vows or any thoughtless utterance of her lips by which she has bound herself, and her husband hears of it, and says nothing to her on the day that he hears, then her vow shall stand, and her pledges by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if, if, on the day that her husband comes to hear of it, he opposes her, then he makes void her vow that was on her, and the thoughtless utterance of her lips by which she bound herself, and then look what it says, and the Lord will forgive her. That's if she makes vows before marrying and then marries. What about if she is married? Verses 10 through 12. And if she vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by a pledge with an oath and her husband heard of it and said nothing to her and he did not oppose her, then all her vows shall stand and every pledge by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband makes them null and void on the day that he hears of them, then whatever proceeds out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning her pledge of herself shall not be stand. Her husband has made them void, and the Lord will forgive her. Wow. The importance of covering, of headship, even of glory. Wow, the responsibility, being a man, the protective covering and the duty of men. Wow, to how we men should honor and love this duty upon us, as should the women among us. And wow, the evil power of a man who will say nothing. If you're wondering, verses 1 through 5 of Numbers 30 apply the same exact truth to fathers with their unmarried daughters. Man, the power and responsibility that comes with glory and headship and covering is huge. You men, when living as biblical men, are the glory of God. If you go on even to verse 15 of Numbers 30, it says something to the effect that he can take the punishment upon himself. We know the one who did this perfectly, the perfect man who did this for his bride, Jesus Christ. But we also see here, powerfully for us men of God, the weight and responsibility that comes with this. With that, I'll transition to legacy as we end. Men, the choices you make in this specific area of biblical manhood are going to have a lasting impact beyond your life even. We've already seen the power of our covering over our wife and our daughters. Do not underestimate how huge this is. This is all part of the legacy that will be left This will have impact on future generations, our children, our grandchildren, our church. This is no small thing we are talking about. The things we have seen in these seven sessions are a multi-generational plan for God to bring all of his chosen people to himself. 
This is God's appointed means to spread his glory to all nations. To do this by his spirit through us, his people. Psalm 78, 1 through 4. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old, things that we have heard and known, that our fathers have told us. Notice that. You see how this works. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Then Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed. It shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And that all started with a man being a man who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. Biblical men being biblical men. In our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our churches, in our workplaces, biblical men, you are the glory of God. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Let me end by reminding you of my goal for these seven teachings, this very exact thing I said in session one. That starting with us men right here, right now, young and old, that there would be a group of men who leave a legacy of other men, young and old. Men of God leading biblical families, leading biblical churches, impacting our communities and our culture as men of God for the glory of God, unashamed, unwavering, founded upon the rock of truth. For generations to come, Lord willing, unless he would come first, of course. And how will we do this? By being men who fear the Lord, who obey the word of God, because we have been saved by the Son of God and live for the glory of God. And now we have seen we are the glory of God and are to live for the covering of those God puts in our lives because biblical men are the glory of God and a covering for women so men Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. And now we have seen what it means to act like a man. May we live accordingly to the glory of God. Amen? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have shown us your glory. We thank you that you have revealed in our hearts, you have shown upon our hearts your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ. Transform our hearts, Lord. Transform our lives. That we would live by faith. That we would live as men, biblical men who love you, who fear you properly. who love being what you created us, men. Men who live for your glory, because we are your glory. Help us, Lord. Empower us, Lord, by your Spirit, that we might live this way in our homes, in our workplaces, in our quiet time when no one's watching with our wives, with our children, with our friends, in all of our relationships, that you would imprint upon our hearts and seal upon our minds that we are your glory, we are to live for your glory. And there is great responsibility, great duty, great power, and there should be great joy that we live as biblical men the way you have called us. Help us to do this for your glory, that your name 
that your name, Jesus, would be spread upon the earth and that we would place some part in living for your glory in this place that we live for the good of others and the spread of your gospel. We ask that you would do this in the name of Jesus. Amen.